The two afternoon sessions today, between now and afternoon tea, and between afternoon tea and, and, and knock off at five, um, I, had, I asked both uh, Rob Vitesi, and I should also acknowledge Rob, who's, well, I was just talking about Sodom, I don't know if he's gone to the gents or he's walked back in, but Rob as well is leading what I think is a fantastic new initiative with the Bureau of Meteorology and Water Planning and Water Information, uh, was also an architect of eWater as well, and so uh, Rob and I uh, put a lot of work, work in when Rob was still at CSIRO, and here, here he is. Rob and I put a lot of work in together to get eWater off the ground, so I just wanted to acknowledge you, Rob, for everything you've done to get eWater off the ground, thank you. But I asked Rob and I asked Bill Young about if they would, wouldn't mind talking this afternoon about how their organisations, the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO, have been in their own world, outside the CRC, using source or planning to use it or using bits and pieces of it or whatever they're doing for the things that are important in their worlds as well. So, luckily, uh, Rob dobbed in Grace Mitchell, who I should say was an eWater program leader for at least some period of time, two or three years, Grace, so very pleased to have Grace here. And uh, Bill dobbed in Peter. It was out the eWater door in the CSIRO door and kept the eWater gig. So, between now and morning tea, I'm going to hand over to Dr Grace Mitchell, who's going to introduce us to the Bureau and its work and perhaps how it's been using source and after afternoon Peter will do the same thing for CSIRO. So, Grace, over to you. Um, and because there is such a close relationship between Bureau of Meteorology and, um, and CSIRO, this afternoon's um, presentations um, in this session about explaining how the Bureau of Meteorology is um, utilising the source model is actually uh, a combined effort between two uh, Bureau staff, um, Andrew Frost and um, Narendra. I always say your name, surname incorrectly, so I'm giving it a try. Shall I lift it a bit higher? Is that better? I do move, but I'm not going to be here for very long. <laughs> so I'll stay still for a very short period of time. And then we've got, um, we originally had, um, had um, Matt Stenson coming down from um, Brisbane um, to speak about um, part of the way um, source is connecting um, within the um, Aura modelling system within um, the Warada Alliance, and so that's the CSRO connection. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it today, so Dave, I think, via SMS, so the modern technology of the world is stepping in, so Dave Penton's going to be then speaking um, on the aspects of how um, some of the CSRO research is being connected in um, to Bureau activities. So I'm just doing a very short introduction um, between um, Narendra speaking, um, and Andrew and Dave speaking. We're just going to have a f um, 10 minutes for questions and at the end we'll have questions for them. So we'll have, um, I'll, be, I'll be jumping up and down as really MC for the afternoon. That's really my main gig here. So I'm sure many, many of you have heard about the Bureau of Meteorology having an expanded um, role in water information. And that really commenced um, with the roles in, in the Water Act in 2007. Um, and a lot of us um, really arrived in earnest in 2008. And since then, um, the role of the Bureau of Meteorology expanding from its um, forecasting, water forecasting role in the flood that it's had for years and years, um, that the, um, the roles in water have extended um, enormously. And um, I think lots of you have probably seen the services we're doing now. Um, and that really comes from the fundamental proposition um, that I'm sure many of you um, um, subscribe to because you're all here and are involved in operating in this space, is really that good water information is um, at the key to improving our water outcomes generally. This is another diagram that um, tries to kind of encapsulate some of the, the way that uh, the, the proposition of the role of the Bureau of Meteorology in this area is structured. And on the left-hand side is about bringing in data from the many, many um, d collectors of data across the country. Um, the storage and use of that model, so storage and databases, use of the, of the data in hydrologic models. But the aspects that we're really going to focus on talking about in this afternoon is on our roles in both um, water reporting and, and forecasting. So it's really uh, going to be the focus of the uh, three talks this afternoon, is how the source um, models actually are being connected in with these functions of the Bureau of Meteorology. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Narendra to talk about first the forecasting aspect of the Bureau of Meteorology and how it links with the source, and then after some questions, Andrew and Dave will talk about how it connects with reporting. Thanks, Grace. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Narendra Tuteja, and I look after water forecasting, essentially 
Uh, within water forecasting in the Bureau, we've got two groups. Uh, one looks after flood forecasting, which has been the traditional role of the Bureau for a couple of decades now. And as a result of water, uh, water information program, the extended hydrological prediction section area was actually created to, to assist in, in uh, what might be called as sort of medium to long term forecasting. Um, so I'm going to talk about really how the water forecast dimensions actually can link into the source on the... So in the forecasting area, really, uh, we look at the supply side. Uh, we don't want to focus too much on the managed systems, and therefore, we believe a platform like Source offers an ideal opportunity to be actually uh, making use of it. And in some way, I've been connected in this journey for the last two years where I've been sitting in the reference group meetings for the last two years as, as this journey has sort of evolved over uh, the last couple of years with, with many of you. So um, whilst we are looking after this from the Bureau's point of view, but uh, the mission is quite broad and no single group can actually endeavor to attain uh, all that sort of expertise. So there are lots and lots of players who have been assisting us into, into this uh, vision. And I think from the last sort of four years when we started, uh, we have come across a long way in the four years. Uh, fundamental to this is the Verada research, which is Water Information Research and Development Alliance between CSIRO and, and the Bureau, uh, mainly on the water side. Uh, and along with that, uh, you'll see an acronym COCR there, which is a similar alliance between Bureau and, the, uh, and, and CSIRO on the climate and weather side. Uh, we've been working a lot with University of Newcastle and University of Adelaide. Uh, on some of the advanced modeling techniques and our association with e-water has been uh, both from those dimensions that, uh, that Grace was talking about. Uh, we've also been working with the university sector and also with our partners internationally. Now, this is a, a fairly big program and we are finishing off about four years into that program uh, and we still have sort of one more year to go before we enter into Virada Mark II. Uh, but this, uh, over the next few weeks, we are actually finalizing our plans for, uh, for this particular program, which is quite ambitious and, and has delivered substantial sort of good to the Bureau, the fundamental research uh, that has assisted us so far. Now, uh, most of you are uh, taking very important water management decisions of some kind, and we have heard a lot of those illustrations in the morning about how fundamental modeling is. Um, now, we come into the dimension of forecasting here and essentially helping out weather, climate forecast, very much bringing it into hydrologic context and how you actually can make use of these forecasts in source-like platforms. So uh, it could be on seasonal forecasting, could be on sort of short-term forecasting up to a week, uh, and there were mention of flood forecasting capability being built up in source. Uh, we believe those products that we're working on directly feed into, into services like this could, that could be built nationally and possibly internationally. So, all of those themes are very familiar. The question is, how do we actually do it? And it's quite a challenge uh, taking from, from research to operational stage. Now, the area that I'm going to focus about very much is on sort of seven to 10 days, which we call short term. Uh, and uh, from there on to three to 12 months, where I think we have made substantial contributions in the last uh, three years time frame. And then uh, since, a lot of work has already been done in jurisdictions and also from CSIRO through sustainable yield work. We've sort of taken a backseat in sort of multi-year multi type of work, but we are uh, trying to make some contributions and you'll get an illustration of that in the next couple of minutes. So where we go uh, with this uh, forecasting on the left, uh, we've got a range of weather and climate models. They all operate on different sort of resolutions for different purposes. And all of those models then essentially can be clubbed together into what we might call the forecasts that are relevant for water management planning. So, so the work that's underway through Virada and Corker actually takes that rainfall and brings that into a seamless product. And that's a substantive body of work that's actually being um, uh, underpinning a lot of research work on stream flow forecasting. So in a sense, uh, the seamless rainfall work that's underway 
a user will not need to worry about what sort of model we are taking uh, the data from. All of that will be amalgamated into a seamless product which will be invisible to the user. In many ways, if it needs to take data from city models or a regional model or a global model, it will all mesh them together in the best possible way so that to suit our water forecasting needs. And those products then essentially work on through some sort of a downscaling technology. And that downscaling technology varies from seasonal applications to sort of flood applications to sort of longer term applications. And those technologies have been evolving and have you know, come a long way in the last four years. And from there, uh, the journey is to again come back from there to hydrologic models to stream flow forecast. And it's not a simple task and something that we started four years ago and thought that it might be a bit easy, but it's been a long journey um, from there to now. And, and I think uh, we will make substantive progress in this area over the next few years. So on the short term forecasting, we have at this point in time a prototype that exists for, for the ovens and currently what we are doing is extending that to at least one catchment in every jurisdiction of the country. So over the next 12 months, uh, there will be a particular uh, pilot like this that will uh, basically be giving forecasts out to 10 days. Not just the forecast, but also what is the uncertainty of the forecast as you go ahead in time. And those forecasts, along with the uncertainty, can directly feed into the models like sources, uh, as we have heard this morning. Uh, there is substantial body of user needs analysis that has been done over the last six months. We have been talking to uh, a lot of our stakeholders uh, to develop what we, what we need to do here. So essentially, again, taking that from, from weather and rainfall forecast in short to medium range to stream flow forecast. So uh, then along with that, this is an area which uh, many of us are very proud of. A service was launched in December 2010 uh, at about 18 to 20 sites, which now has grown to 36. And, and our plan is to take that by the end of the year to 70 sites across the country. So the, the schematic on the, on the top, on the top right, is actually uh, the stream flow forecast products that are already available at those 36 locations. So every seventh of the month, we produce three month ahead probabilistic stream flow forecast that can directly plug into models like source. Uh, the, the visual on the, on the bottom right are the sites that we are currently investigating across the country where we will provide the service by the end of the year. So we started with about 100 odd sites and those 100 sites will zoom into about 70 by the end of the year. And, and the service will then expand to about 250, 300 odd locations across the country in, in the coming years. The underpinning model is a, is a Bayesian uh, joint probability model developed by CSIRO through the Virada program and, and that's sort of fundamentally the, the computational engine for this. Oops. Uh, there is uh, more work that has been done in dynamic areas, as we know, uh, statistical relationships uh, under the climate change scenario uh, have got a bit of an issue uh, to deal with, uh, and the dynamic approaches that are being developed. Uh, so, so what we'll have by the end of this year, we, we have 70 sites for which we'll have statistical forecasts as operationally available to the, to the public. The second product that we're working on is dynamic forecast that will be available at 50 sites. Uh, and those 50 sites would be available for, for sort of um, uh, through registered user website. And then in 2013, our plan is to actually bring these two products together and merge them together so that as an end user, uh, people see one set of products, not two. Uh, and that's the system that we are building, uh, which is a seasonal stream flow forecasting system. And you'll see the, the model kernels on the right. They are the real heart and soul of, of this particular system. Uh, the BJP model, which is the current statistical model, uh, there's a monthly model called Wapaba, which actually allows us to go out to nine month forecast. So there has been a need for going out to nine months from the users and that technology between BJP and Wapaba is helping us to actually extend from our three months capability out to nine months. 
In addition, we have made use of a lot of time models that was talked about um, uh, through the eWater program, and we have, most of our experimental system is dynamics area is actually built on those time catchment models. Uh, and then those models obviously need to be calibrated under sort of uh, advanced uncertainty paradigms, which is where we bring in the Batia technology. And uh, a lot of uh, the downscaling work that we talked about is actually embedded here. So all of that system is really the computational element, and all of this infrastructure is to get the thing going 24-7. Uh, just to give an illustration of the types of skills that we can get, uh, we are uh, not going to go through those details into this, but those are the skill measures, if you like, in probability space. And this is, these are the skills which we conventionally use in hydrology, very much in volume of water space. Along the rows, uh, what we have is the catchment. So, so each of those rows corresponds to each of these catchments. And along the, along the horizontal axis, we got the months. So each month, we got essentially an outlook for a monthly forecast or a three-monthly forecast. With the statistical approach, we have essentially three monthly capability as of now. Through dynamic, we are building up monthly as well as three monthly. So every fortnight, we will have, with effect from January, a forecast available for about 50 locations across the country. And then along with that, we'll have a three monthly outlook whilst research is underway to go beyond three months time frame. Now, the question is, uh, where do we do this work? Uh, whether it is uh, short-term forecasting or seasonal forecasting or sort of long-term climate change or decadal variability type of scales. And, and that's uh, the work that we have done with our stakeholders over the last six months. Uh, substantive meetings have been held with almost every agency across the country that has something to do with water and environment. And through that, what we have actually done is uh, where do you think is a need for us to be doing this forecasting work? Uh, the second dimension to this is where is the data of a sufficient quality where you can do a work of this nature? So in a way, this exercise has been to marry those things together. And through that exercise, what we established is a list of stations which we call, as of now, hydrologic reference stations or Australian network of uh, stream flow reference stations. And this will become largely the high quality test beds for most of the work on water availability studies across Australia, at least in the forecasting space. Now, as of now, we've got the list of 259 odd stations and there's substantial sort of uh, communications you will see in this work uh, for a web portal that is to be delivered uh, before the end of this year. Now, some of the products that look like from this, uh, this is just a visual of uh, things that are mock up uh, at this stage. Uh, but what we are trying to do is really give not just the data, but also the decadal and interdecadal type of trends. We are not unpacking uh, what these trends are attributed to, how much to uh, because of climate variability and climate change and land use effects. But our intention is, as research in this space actually matures, uh, we will then be unpacking the trends across the nation. Now, the issue of coupling, how do we couple these forecasts with the, with the, uh, with the source model? And uh, whilst it's a very fascinating area, there's some challenges to come across too. And we try to capture, so now first thing is obviously data availability. What we think, uh, much of this we, we are doing in our seasonal forecasting system that I was talking about, will actually produce those uh, whether it is weekly or monthly forecast or for, uh, fortnightly forecast out to three to nine months time frame through uh, a database that will sit inside o ORIS, our Australian Water Source Information System. Through that, we will make that data available through a web service. And that will be available to its users based on their needs. So not all data will be made available publicly, but to the advanced users like yourselves, there will be different sort of cascading levels if you like. So through that web service, we will basically work with the eWater community to actually build up a client here. And so that this client actually gets data from this automatically whenever Bureau loads or uploads this particular data. And then that gets into the source model. And that will, to us, make a seamless sort of a data exchange. Now, uh, along with the forecast, uh, obviously you need to see first for yourself 
whether or not you depend these forecasts. Can you go back in time and operate your systems very much as if you have no knowledge of the future? And that's what we mean by hindcast. So climatologists and weather scientists have been working on this for a lot of time, but in water, this is a new area. So what we've done is gone back to the to 1980 time frame and operated very much as if we are operating into the future from 1980 to 2010, 2011. And that hindcast process has produced massive data sets. And that data set, we will make them available to the community, to the e-water community, to be made use of, and go back and look at your water sharing plans and put this information into your systems and say how you could have operated them differently. And that's the essence of the message I want to convey here. So not only will we provide the forecast, we'll also give you the data that you actually go back and re-evaluate re your hypothesis. Uh, there are, however, research challenges, uh, and I want to quickly go through that without delving deep into that, but at least give what's coming. Uh, as we heard in the morning, uh, we are, we've covered part of the journey, uh, and a lot of sort of uh, things have to be, to be learned in the future as well. Now, uh, first question is, uh, the forecasts are probabilistic. They're not deterministic, so we're not making a single value forecast. We are making a distribution of forecasts. If the skill is very high and the precision is very high, it's a very tight range. But as we move up north, as we know when we move from summer dominant to tropical systems, our uncertainties go up, which means we need larger spread of data. So all the complex diagrams that we saw from Rob Carr's presentation this morning have to be exposed, not to a single valued outcome, but a multiple ensemble outcome, and that is uh, something which is a challenge that we have to come through. And uh, some of us who have done uh, in the water industry uh, the deterministic type of modeling work, uh, it is a big game changer when you come to ensemble modeling. Uh, and for example, the ensembles that we will produce will be, for each forecast, there will be something like 5,000 ensembles. So to deal with that system with a complex system like source, uh, there is substantial sort of work that has to be done by uh, the likes of CSRO and Bureau and, and, and its partners from the university sector to actually move to the next stage. So the next thing uh, also is uh, we all know that these services take time to build. Uh, it's not going to be built overnight. Uh, substantial progress has been made. Uh, I think we are way ahead of where we were four years ago, but at the same time, uh, it is also important to note we're not making forecasts everywhere. So you're going from whole of land to the sea system modeling, but the forecast will be produced at certain locations, which means not all nodes that you are dealing with at the supply side of source actually are going to provide the forecast, which does mean you may have forecast a couple of locations, but what do you do here? The techniques that have been developed in Verada and our cooperation with the university sector are the foundations for that work to happen. Uh, we have in the Bureau embraced the Bayesian concept, whether it is statistical approaches or dynamic approaches. In both those cases, those technologies are operationally available. So the work that the Bureau can do along with its research partners and the e-water community can bring that technology into source and then plug it